For the past several weeks, we have been going through a sermon series, a message series, whatever you want to call it, uh, on one topic, and we've been calling this series Objections. And over the course of this series, we've been taking a look at the uh, many objections, well, some of the objections that people have uh, to Christianity. Um, not all of your family members or friends or coworkers or neighbors are here with you today. Um, and one of the reasons why is that some of those people have objections about connecting to a church or connecting to the Christian faith. And a lot of the objections that people have, they make sense. I mean, if you really take a look at some of the reasons, you know, the reasons why people don't want to connect to church, why people don't want to connect to Christianity, these re- they, they make sense. They're, they're reasonable objections that people have. I mean, they really are. I'm not saying all things are valid. I'm just saying they're reasonable objections. And so we've taken a look at several objections, and I told you I've got two goals going throughout this series. One of my goals is if you have these objections, I just want to give you some food for thought, some things to consider. I don't know that I can change your mind or convince you of anything. Um, but just give you some things to think about. And the other goal that I have is, you know, if you're already a Christian, I hope that I can help broaden your perspective. I mean, we need to broaden our perspective a little bit. Those of us who have been in the Christian bubble for a long time and do Christian stuff and have all Christian friends and all Christian family and a Christian job and a Christian home and a Christian car, sometimes we forget what it's like outside of that bubble. And so hopefully as we're going through this series, we can see a little bit more clearly into what it's like to be outside of that Christian community. And so the objection that we're um, going to, to wrestle with and talk about today is, um, is this thing, this accusation that Christians can be judgmental. That's one of the accusations out there about Christians, about you know, Christian people, about church people, is that we can be judgmental. Have you heard that about Christians, that Christians can be judgmental? That's not new news, right? You're already aware of that. Christians can be judgmental. And, and so the objection is very simple. Christians are judgmental. I don't want to be thought of as judgmental, so I want to separate myself from Christianity. If those church people are judgmental, hey, I'm not that. I don't want to be that, so I'm going to separate myself from that. And see, this is, again, is one of those things where a person may, you know, may have no problem at all with Jesus. You know, what I know about Jesus, he sounds great, he's wonderful, but I don't want to be associated with any kind of group of people who are judgmental, all right? I mean, I wouldn't be either. I don't want to be associated with judgmental people. I mean, none of us do. That's one of the accusations out there about Christianity is that Christians can be judgmental. Several years ago, several years ago, uh, when I was 18, um, I had a, uh, this was during a stage of my life where I'd made a choice to, to disconnect from the church. Uh, there were a couple of years like that. I was like, you know what? Jesus is great. I'm going to hang on to Jesus, but I, I just need to be away from the church. I need to be away from Christianity. And I, just, I had my own reasons. They weren't great reasons. And I changed my mind clearly, but there were a couple of years that I really wanted to stay away from, from the church. And then Somebody convinced me to go to a, a Bible study. The college I was going to had a little, you know, it was, it was actually a, like an arts school, um, but they had a little tiny Bible study. I was like, okay, so I checked it out, and I didn't like it. Um, but going to this thing, I only went once, but going to it kind of like it outed me as a Christian. <laughs> and so then people knew that I was a Christian. Well, there was a girl in that Bible study who was friends with my roommate, and so she came over to our apartment, and, and I didn't know she was there, or I didn't care that she was there, and I said a bad word, all right? I let some language slip. Um, and if you find that shocking, believe me, I've done a lot worse than that. Uh, but that was then, and this is now. And so when I let that bad word slip, she said, oh, I, th- I, th- I thought you were a Christian, and I wouldn't think you would use language like that. Now, here's the thing. This girl who said that, she had a reputation. She had a reputation. All right? She was a girl with a reputation. And I'm like, my mind is blown. I mean, this is happening in my own home. Somebody's telling me that what I should and should not be doing. I'm like, what, 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 what? And all I said in the moment was, are you judging me? That shut it down. She said, oh, no, I, I, no I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't mean to judge. I didn't, I, I didn't mean to judge. And that was the end of our exchange. And I walked away from that moment feeling like victory, right? I shut her down. I won that, right? <clears throat> but it was really, it was like, That's, this is obnoxious. I mean, yeah, okay, fine. Maybe I shouldn't have said what I said, but you shouldn't be doing what you're doing. And everybody knows what you're doing. Who are you to judge me? Have you ever felt like that? Somebody come into your life like, who are you? I know you. I know the junk in your life. 
Who are you to judge me? Now, I shut down that conversation by my mentioning the judgment thing because if there's one thing that Christians know that we're supposed to know is that we shouldn't be judgmental, right? I mean, that's one thing most of us, a lot of us, you know, if you've been a Christian for a long time, you know that. Not supposed to be judgmental. Don't want to be accused of being judgmental. Not supposed to be. I mean, Jesus said it. You heard the scripture passage, passage Michelle read, right? Those are the words of Jesus. Let's, t- let's take a look at that passage again. Um, it's printed in your bulletin. It's Matthew 7. And like I said, these are the words of Jesus. He's given this, you know, we call it now the Sermon on the Mountain because he preached it on a mountain. And um, in the midst of this longer teaching time, he, he addresses this issue. He says, do not judge. Well, there you go. I mean, that's it. Jesus said it. Do not judge. End of story, right? Do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Now, Jesus doesn't specifically say, hey, however much you judge other people, that's how much God is going to judge you back. But that's implied. All right, there are two ways to look at this. You know, Jesus is either saying, well, other people in your life are going to be judgmental towards you if you're judgmental towards them. Or, and I tend to believe that he's talking about God's judgment. You know, if you're judgmental towards other people, you better brace yourself for God's judgment coming your way. And then he gives us this really, it's, it's perfect. It's strange, but it's a perfect picture of what this is like. And he says, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank sticking out of your own eye? I mean, that's a, a, can you visualize that? You know, I don't have props with me this morning. Well, here's a little speck. Okay, so there's a speck prop. All right, sure it is. Um, but can you imagine that, how strange that is? I mean, he's saying, you're walking around with this huge board sticking out of your eye, paying no attention to it, trying to help somebody with a bit of sawdust in their eye doesn't add up doesn't make sense verse four how can you say to your brother let me take the speck out of your eye when the whole time there's a plank in your own eye you hypocrite and so you could say well that's that's all there is to it we are not to judge other people case closed except jesus didn't stop there he says first and don't miss this verse a lot of us miss this verse first take the plank out of your own eye And then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Now, sticking with this, with the imagery that Jesus has given us here about, you know, the little tiny speck of sawdust in somebody's eye. He's not saying don't touch. He's not saying don't try to help that other person. He's saying, whoa, whoa, whoa. first, take the plank out of your own eye. When I read this passage of scripture, I have some questions. One of my questions is, well, when? when? When would I, someone like me, be qualified to take a speck of sawdust out of somebody else's eye? When is that plank fully removed from my own eye? And see, that's, that's a tough question to answer because that's going to vary from individual to individual. That sense of, you know, can I really broach this topic? All right? Am I allowed to talk to this individual about what's going on in their life? Am I allowed to point that speck out in their eye? Am I allowed to do that yet? That's, that's a tough question to answer. And as I said, that varies from person to person. Other questions I have. Why? Why should I remove the, try to remove the speck from my brother's eye? Why and how? And those two questions are related. And the why, I mean, we get a clear, if you're going to read, you know, the, the larger context of what Jesus had to say and, and look at his life and how he, he carried out his ministry, we get an answer to that question. Why? We should take the speck. We should try to help our brothers and sisters take the specks out of their eye because we love them, okay? Because we see something going on in their lives and we say, if you keep this up, I'm afraid you're gonna end up hurting yourself and other people. I mean, it's supposed to be you know, motivated by love, motivating by, I care about you too much to let you walk around with that speck in your eye. I care about you too much to, to see you hurting yourself and other people doing this thing that you're not supposed to be doing, all right? And so it's supposed to be motivated by love, concern, caring, and how we do it. So this is the beauty part about this, this visualization, this visual that Jesus gives us. Think about, literally, think about how gentle you would have to be <laughs> to literally take a speck of sawdust out of somebody else's eye. You're not going to, okay, let me just grab that out for you, you know? Has anybody ever been to the doctor with something in your eye you had to have removed? I, well, good, me neither. That, that'd be terrible. 
I mean, oh, I've got an eye thing. Don't even talk to me about this stuff. That's just, uh, it freaks me out. I get scared of like needles in the eye. And, oh, whatever. I don't, I don't know what I'm talking about. Anyway, but you'd have to be so gentle, so gentle and delicate and careful. And if you're going to do this with someone, if you're actually going to try to help them to remove a speck from the eye, you have, I mean, it's an agonizing process for the person who's trying to remove that speck. How do I bring this topic up? I don't want them to think I'm being judgmental. I don't want them to think, you know, that I don't care about them. I want them to know my heart. I want them to know that I love them. Like, it's, it's, it can be agonizing trying to figure out how do I bring this up? How do I help this person? And one of the mistakes Christians make is like, you know what? It's agonizing. It's too tough. I'm not doing it. Jesus doesn't say, doesn't, don't do it. Don't try to help your brothers and sisters. He says, first take the plank out of your own eye, and then you can see clearly And you can carefully and delicately help your brothers and sisters out. And so we've got the question, well, when can you help do this? Well, you got to remove the plank from your own eye, whatever that looks like in your life. You know, I don't know what that looks like in your life. You'll have to figure that out. But then why out of concern for the, it's not about me saying, hey, listen, I know the Bible better than you. And I know that you're doing something you're not supposed to do. So I'm right and you're wrong. Look at that. That's not why we're supposed to be removing specs. Okay. It's out of concern for the other person. Okay. And so that's what we're supposed to do. Now, the last question, and again, I think this is something collectively as Christians, this is something we don't ask. This is something we have overlooked. This is a, as a mistake that we've made. The last question is, who? Who are you talking about here, Jesus? You're saying that we need to remove the plank from our own eyes so that we can remove the speck from our brother's eye. Who, who is that? Who are you talking about? And you, that might not seem like a, that important of an issue. It, it, it's a very, very important issue. And Paul, the Apostle Paul, who wrote most of our New Testament, he has something to say about that issue. And, and if you have your Bible with you today, you can turn with me. Um, we're going to look at a passage from 1 Corinthians chapter 5. I almost asked Michelle to read this passage, but it's a really tough passage, and I thought that wouldn't be fair. I think last time you read, you had a tough passage too, so... <clears throat> So we're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and just to give you some background on what's going on here, this was a letter written by Paul. Paul was, he was a lot of things. He was a missionary, he was a church planner, church starter, whatever you want to call it. He'd travel around the world, meet with different communities of people, tell them what was up about God, say, hey, God loves you, he loves you so much, he wants you to be with him forever, he sent his son to die on a cross for your sins. If you receive him, you can have eternal life. Now you're a church, see ya. I mean, that's what Paul did. He went around starting up churches. And he always left before that community, before that new church had all their questions answered. Because if he didn't leave, he was, you know, if he was going to wait till all their questions were answered, he never would have left. And so he started these churches. He helped them get some kind of leadership going. And then he would leave. And then he'd correspond with the church leaders through mail. Okay, they'd send each other letters. And so this, this area where, where this church was started, actually this church in Corinth was in some ways like, like our church, like Hope Community Church. Um, in, in its size, um, there was probably about you know, 50 people who were part of this church, maybe more, maybe less. Um, they didn't have their own building. They met either in homes or in public spaces. Uh, so when you're thinking about this letter written to a church, it's written to a smaller group of people. And so something's going on in this church that's really messed up. And Paul's got to call him out on it, all right? That was part of his burden in life, having to let people know, okay, you can't be doing this. And so let me try to tell you what was happening here. And, and you can read this for yourself. Um, it's 1 Corinthians chapter 5. But basically what we have is this. You have a, a father and a mother and a son. Father, mother, son. And for some reason, the mother is gone. She either dies or there's a divorce. And so you've got father, son, and then there's a stepmom. Father gets remarried. So you have father, stepmom, son. Everybody with me so far? All right. Well, then something happens between son and stepmom. They get into a relationship. And we don't know, well, did dad and stepmom divorce first? We don't know that. But stepmom and son are now together, an intimate relationship, and it is known in the church. And this son, this guy, he was a part of the church. He was, I don't know if he was a leader in the church, but it's a small group. Everybody knew everybody else's business. And so they knew that was going on, and the church responded by applauding it. 
They were proud. We're going to read. They were proud that this was going on. And you may think, how on earth could they be proud? Let me read some of it to you. It's, a, you know, it's an icky, icky thing. I mean, I saw some of your faces I was describing. I was like, oh. And you know what? That's exactly what the people outside of the church thought. When they looked in at this community of Christians, church people, whatever those guys are, what are they doing over there? They looked in and saw this happening, and they went, oh, nah, nasty. I mean, that was their reaction. And so chapter 5, verse 2, and, and now Paul's addressing this issue. And you are proud? You are proud that this is going on? Shouldn't you rather have gone into mourning? Shouldn't you have been ashamed that this is happening in your midst? Why are you celebrating this? Now listen, this may sound like, well, something like this would never happen today. It kind of still does. Maybe not something specifically this gross. But there are things that happen in our churches that are wrong, that are celebrated. I'm going to tell you a story, okay? This is a true story. People I know, not saying any names, okay? There's a guy, grew up in a Christian home, whatever that means, goes to a Christian church his whole life, and over the course of his life took on various leadership roles within that church, different committees, you know, whatever. We don't have, do we have committees here? I don't think so. Anyway, he did a lot of these things, a lot of leadership and all this, and he was married, and his wife was very, very difficult. She was not good to him. It was not a good relation, and it was really, it was, I mean, it looked like it was her, okay? You know what I mean? I can't like, well, can you assign blame and when there's a bad rel- It was her fault, okay? And so he divorces his wife. And when that happens, the congregation just cheers him on. They say, oh, I'm so glad you're out of that relationship. I'm so glad, you know, that wasn't good and she was terrible to you and you're out of it and that's, that's I'm so glad for you. Now you can finally be happy. Well, listen, I, I can appreciate that. If this guy was somebody you knew and you saw him going through misery and he's out, now he's divorced and he gets to be away from that person, that, you know, you'll be like, okay, I'm so glad for you. But, wait a minute, what does Jesus have to say about divorce? Jesus didn't say, okay, well, if, it's, if, it, if you're not happy, you can d- divorce, it's fine. He didn't say that. Jesus, what Jesus said about divorce is that there's only one legitimate grounds for divorce, and that's if there's adultery, if there's cheating going on. That's grounds for divorce. And Jesus even said, you don't have to get divorced. He never said, okay, if cheating happens, you need to get divorced. He didn't say that, but he said, you can get divorced if that's the state of things. And so, you know, I I think an appropriate response from the congregation would have been to say, listen, you know, it's a shame that it had to happen this way. It's a shame that you had to go through this divorce. But, you know, I feel for you. I'm compassionate towards you. I understand what you're going through. Like, that would have been a much more appropriate response than, than actually celebrating a divorce. I mean, are you with me there? Do you see what I'm saying? Like, I get that these things happen, all right? I get it. But there's a difference between celebrating it and being kind of sympathetic towards it. Do you know what I'm saying? And so they're celebrating it. Well, the story goes on. And this guy now finds another woman. And she's great. She's wonderful. And they hit it off. They've got a great connection. They've got great chemistry. And it's a good thing. Church is celebrating it. That's great. One, one, one tiny little hiccup. She's married. Now, she had been separated for several... Uh, yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> now, she had been separated from her husband for a long time, but still on the books is married. And so now this guy, he went through a divorce. Not supposed to do that, but we get it. Okay, all right. And then he starts seeing someone else who's married. And the congregation is just, the, the overwhelming majority of the congregation, they're thrilled for him. I'm so glad to see you're in a better relationship now. I'm so glad. To, and if you, were, if, you were, you know, if you were friends with this guy, you might feel the same way. Wouldn't you? And be like, oh, I'm, I'm glad to see you out of this and into something better. But it was wrong, right? It, it's contrary to God's word. And so it's not the kind of stuff that we're supposed to endorse as a collective, as the church. And if you think that's an icky story, just imagine being outside of that church and hearing about this. Hey, there's this church over here and there's this Christian guy and he got a divorce. And I thought you weren't supposed to get a divorce. Maybe I'm wrong about that. I don't know. But I heard about this church and their guy got divorced and then he starts seeing somebody who's married. Now, I'm pretty sure you're not supposed to do that. But that's what they do over in that church. So uh, who knows? That's where this gets complicated. 
It's not about, you know, we can't be compassionate towards people who go through tough stuff and people out. No, we should be. But say, we, have, we collectively as a church, we have been charged with this mission of, of communicating to the best of our ability these profound messages of God. I mean, that's, that's our job to share God's truth and God's message. And when we endorse or celebrate things that are wrong, we are confusing that message. And you have to think about it from God's perspective. He doesn't want that message confused. And you have to think about it from the perspective that the outsider looking in, they're like, oh, I don't get it. I'm confused. What, what is this all about? What does it mean to be a Christian? I guess it doesn't really mean anything. It's just some religious thing. I don't get it. You have to think of it from, from those perspectives. Is that making sense at all? It's a tricky issue. All right, this, is, this is getting messy. I know it's getting messy. I think we're going to get to a point of clarity soon. So hang in there, all right? And so Paul, listen to this. Man, Paul, he had some guts for saying this. He says, you're proud, shouldn't you have gone into mourning again over this situation with the guy who's now with his stepmom, that's gross, whatever. You should have gone into mourning and put, put this guy out of your fellowship. Cast him out. Verse three. I mean, that's, you want to kick the guy out of the church? Paul, we're supposed to be growing as a church and inviting people and including people and we want to grow and we want to expand, but you got to know the heart of Paul. He wanted the message of God to be clearly communicated. And I'm sure what would have been better is if they said to this guy, listen, let us help you take this speck or fairly large size plank out of your eye. Let us help you get your life back together. Then we're clearly communicating the message of God. Then we're, you know, people outside, the pagans, they all think we're gross now. We got to change their, you know, ideas about what it means to be a Christian. But if he's not going to listen, you got to get rid of that. You can't contaminate the message. Tricky, tricky thing. Here we go, Paul. What else do you have to say? For my part, verse 3. Even though I'm not physically present, I'm with you in spirit. And as one who is present with you in this way, I have already passed judgment in the name of our Lord Jesus. Paul, you're not allowed to judge people. Paul, haven't you read the Bible? If you ask Paul that question, well, yeah, I've read it. I wrote most of your New Testament, okay? I'm writing the Bible right now. I'm saying this. So you, you're, you're, wait, 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 I'm confused. Jesus says, do not judge. Paul is saying, I've already cast judgment. Was Paul doing something wrong? How, how, how does this work? And did you see, if you have your Bibles open, I've passed judgment in the name of our Lord Jesus. He, I mean, he's, he's, you know, he's naming names. I'm doing this in Jesus' name. I'm casting down judgment. Can you do that, Paul? <clears throat> All right. We're going to get clearer now. Here we go. <clears throat> the issue is this. It's the who. Remember we talked about that? Removing the speck from your brother's eye. Who is your brother? Who were who we like? like what, how does it? Who? Who, who, who? And this church was confused about the who. Who are we supposed to be helping out? Who are we supposed to be trying to remove specks from their eye? And Paul addresses this just later on in the chapter. Verse 9. He says, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Okay? I wrote that to you already. And he says, let me clarify. Not at all meaning the people of this world. And so Paul is, is trying to say, listen, you guys were confused about something. Let me bring this to your attention. I told you before in a previous letter, by the way, we don't have that letter. It didn't make it to the New Testament. That letter was lost. Okay. But he said, I told you before in a previous letter, you can't associate with someone who's sexually immoral, who's doing something that's overtly, blatantly against God's will. You can't do it. And he said, but I didn't mean all people. I meant people of the world. Now, see, in Scripture, we have that term, the world, and that refers to, like, the world outside of the church. There's the church, and then there's those outside of the church, and that's the world, and so that's the separation that Paul's trying. Like, oh, I wasn't talking about them. I was talking about inside your own community. You can't, you can't, you can't have that in your own community. Not at, all, uh, not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral and greedy and swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you would have to leave the world, Right? Paul's saying, if you weren't allowed to, to associate with people who were sinful and had stuff going and had garbage in their lives, you'd have to get on a rocket ship and leave. So that's not what I was saying. But now I am writing, so let me clear up, Paul's saying, but now I am writing to you that you might, must not associate with anyone, listen, who claims to be a brother, that's the word Jesus used, a brother or sister. He's creating a difference. And here's what this comes down to. Expectations. 
And what Paul is getting at here is that it is fair and it is right for you expect your fellow Christians to behave as Christians. L- let me continue. It says, you know, you, if, if, if you can't associate with a brother or a sister who is sexually immoral or greedy or an idolater or a slanderer or a drunkard or a swindler, don't even eat with such people. But verse 12, here's what he says. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? That's it. That's the important distinction. And this is what Paul said. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? That's it. And when it comes to this issue of judgment, you know, like I said, it's a matter of expectations. It is fair. It makes sense to expect other Christian people to behave in a way that pleases God, doesn't it? That's a fair expectation. Now, I know it gets a little bit messy. You say, well, that guy over there, he's been a Christian for 30 years. I've been a Christian for two minutes. You, you cut me some slack. The answer there would be yes, Absolutely. But it's another thing to be mature, to be leading, or to be growing up in the church and say, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know better than this. And then it becomes a burden on your fellow Christians to have to come into your life and say, we want to be gentle, but we have to address this issue with you because we love you. We're not judging you. Well, we're kind of judging you. But you're within a body. So we're allowed to. That's what Paul said, right? It's very, very icky. It's, it's, it's messy. It's messy. It's messy. But, but here's what we can make simple. Those who, are not out, and those who are not part of the church, those who are outside of the church, we have no right, no right to judge them. No right at all. Why should we expect people who aren't Christians to live like they are? And that's one of the big points Paul is making in this, in this letter here. He's saying, listen, you know, hold those expectations. You know, you can have those standards. Jesus told us to do certain things. Yeah, let's do them together as Christians. Don't hold other people who are outside of the church up to those expectations, up to those standards. That's not fair. That doesn't make sense. Now, please hear me on this. I'm not saying that, you know, if if you're not a Christian, you can do whatever you want and it's right and it's fair and everybody's truth is, is all equal. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying they're not claiming to be Christians. They're not trying. They're not trying to follow Jesus. We are. So we can't hold them up to our standards. That is not a fair expectation. Now, this whole internal, you know, judging thing that needs to happen within the church, I don't, let's not even use that word, this whole internal kind of watching over each other and keeping each other accountable and, and loving each other enough to say, hey, listen, I'm noticing this in your life. We need to correct this. That's messy. Okay, sure. And we need to do that with love and with grace and with patience and it takes time and all that. But as far as outsiders are concerned, no right whatsoever. We have no right whatsoever to judge people all right? Is that, I mean, isn't that simple when you think about it? That's where we've messed up as Christians. We kind of look past the stuff that's going on in our own churches. And, well, whatever, it's fine. We don't, you know, we're not trying to follow the, follow the Bible all the time. Well, come on. We look past that stuff, and then we look outside of the church and say, well, how can they put on TV shows like that? Or how can those two people date around and do that? How can they do that? Well, they're not trying to be Christians. They're not claiming to be followers of Jesus. It's that simple. And so to those of you, if you're watching this or if you're listening online, to those of you, if you're outside the church, you're not a Christian, you're not a church person, and you feel like you've been judged, you've been held up to an expectation, I'm sorry. I mean, on behalf of all of us, I'm sorry. That's not fair. That wasn't fair. That's not a fair expectation. And I really can't even, if that's your objection to Christianity, I mean, I don't even know if I can give you food for thought other than just to say I'm sorry. We should not have done that. We weren't taking care of our own business. We should have been focused internally and not not focused on judging you. We were wrong. And for those of us who are Christians already, if you consider yourself a Christian person, just understand where that line is. Okay, try to see the world through the eyes of someone who's not a Christian. They're not claiming to be a follower of Christian, a follower of Jesus. They're not claiming to be a member of the church. Let's not expect them to act like one. All right, let's not put an unfair expectation on people who are not Christians. Can we make that agreement as a church? I mean, really, can we do that? This needs to be part of our culture as Hope Community Church. We don't go out there putting unfair expectations on people who aren't Christians. That's not a very catchy sentence, but, but that's what, something we need to be about. Can we agree on that? Good. Now, internally, I know it gets messy watching out for each other, but let's also agree to love one another, okay? 
Because when that accountability, when that's flowing out of a place of love, and that you know, speck removal, if we can stick with the way Jesus put it, when that's done out of love, that's a powerful thing. I'm not saying it's easy, but it's a powerful thing. And so let's consider that. As we move forward collectively as a Christian group, we don't, we don't judge others. <laughs> we don't judge people outside of this community.